Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to the Black Carnivore Podcast. I am really excited to talk to Anna today, who is a longtime carnivore, or is that the right way to say it? Um, a longtime follower of the carnivore diet. And um, she's going to talk to us about her experience and her successes. And, um, and I'm really excited to hear her story. And as you can tell, uh, we... <laughs> We have the same awesome hair, so I'm really excited to hear the hair aspects of her story as well. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce Anna. Anna, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? How did you come to Carnivore and uh, why? Why did you even d decide to consider it in the first place? Hi, thank you for having me. I came to Carnivore, I think like a lot of people, through keto. And... I immediately found freedom in keto. I, it, it started to curb my cravings. I felt, I started to understand what hunger really meant versus just snacking. Uh, so it was a great beginning. And, uh, but after about a year, I noticed how many times I would go off keto and then have these guilty feelings and how many times I would have to like every day figure out what is the serving size of this and how 12 almonds turns into 99 almonds <laughs> really quickly and uh, wondering do I really need to do macros on my dirty keto on my clean keto and how many carbs did I have blah 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 and it just was wearisome and it didn't feel organic and it just uh, it didn't feel natural. And I just always go back to the very basics of almost any discipline in my life, anything in my life. And I was like, this is just really going against uh, just what I believe, how everything should work. Uh, so if you read enough keto things and you watch enough YouTube, you will venture over into some of the carnivore will start like crossing <laughs> and I was just like huh what is this and uh started looking at uh I think my first was Joe Rogan and uh, Sean Baker Dr. Sean Baker and then it clicked my daughter told me about the GAPS diet years ago my oldest daughter and I was like no way like no way are people just eating meat and then I thought, well, wait a minute, people did just eat meat for centuries. Think about geography. And uh, so that just came flooding back. And I said, okay, I got to try this out. And I tried it out and magic, the magic happened and the snacking stopped. Uh, that was my first big um, revelation was that we are not meant to snack all day long and constantly have food coming in. Uh, and then um, my real superpower, just like, you know, I, I just say now, like when I look back, my superpower uh, is carnivore and that morphed into fasting. And those two things together have changed my life for the rest of my life. Uh, so that's like, um, I, I first jumped into carnivore, like feet first. It was, it was easy coming from keto. Uh, I didn't have a lot of, I didn't have any of the carb flu kind of stuff, the keto flu thing. Uh, and I was highly successful for several months. I even went to Puerto Rico on a big fancy trip with um, a lot of people, bodybuilders, this group of uh, my husband's friends, and they ate everywhere and everything. And I just, people were like every meal, like, are you serious? You don't want the, the, those green beans? You don't want that salad? Can I have your bread? And I just ordered double meat. And I mean, it was, it was fantastic. And um, a couple months after I got back, I thought, what if I could meld carnivore with keto and do kind of a ketovore thing? And then maybe sometimes I would have some almonds and maybe sometimes I would have a Caesar salad at a restaurant. And that was bad news. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, really? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I wish that worked. It did not work for me. And yeah. I know that it works for some people and, and that is fantastic, but I am not a moderator. I am, uh, I am a bohemian artist 
and I'm free flowing and I'm like, give it all to me or give none to me. But I, yeah. I did not do well with moderate and immediately snacking came back and immediately, like I was thinking about food all the time. And um, I lost my mojo for many months. And um, it was very hard to get back, really hard to get back. So I will not be doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I feel really, really happy. So when I came back to Carnivore, um, I, I'm actually glad that it happened. I mean, you know, in the scheme of things, like it is what it is and I can't change it. But when I came back, I had so much more power and knowledge and I read a lot more books. I found Dr. Jason Fung, who I absolutely adore. If I met him in person, I'd probably give him the biggest hug. <laughs> I, found, uh, I found Jen Stevens, who, although is not keto or carnivore, really gave me even more insight into fasting. And um, Jim Stevens? Jen Stevens, who, uh, her book, she has a book, Feast, Fast, Repeat. And okay. she has another book called Delay, Don't Deny. And there oh, are, I do remember that first one, Delay, Don't Deny. Yeah, so this is her newest one, which has a lot more science mm -hmm. and it's heftier. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, you know, it, seeing legions of people and, and just showing me that fasting is amazing. But when I combine it with carnivore, there's just no equal to that. And mm -hmm. so this time when I came back, I just automatically had even more attention to uh, my hunger signals, satiety, um, different hormones and things that were happening. And I really realized I'm just, I'm never hungry in the morning. Like, Maybe once a month, if I have a crazy workout the day, I don't know. But I'm just never hungry. In 18 to 20 hours is kind of my sweet spot. And I eat um, whatever I want <laughs> because the, the things that I want are uh, steak or beef or bacon or um, hot wings or um, a very large dose of cream in my coffee. And then I'm not hungry again. Um, I'll have uh, a smaller meal, maybe about at one average, it's about four hours later. Um, and then I'm done. And, and then many times like yesterday, the smaller meal didn't happen. I just was like, Ooh, I'm just not hungry. So I had chai and read a book and had a great, um, evening. So, wow. Yeah. So I, I have so many questions to ask and uh, I'm not even sure where to start. So I see your surroundings and your background, that painting behind you is awesome. And I see the one on the wall. So you're clearly an artist and a creative type, but I often feel like, you know, in the artsy, creative, spiritual health world, the expectation is to be uh, at the, you know, at the minimum, like, uh, you know, a pescatarian and, you know, to be working your way towards vegan. So how do you, you know, operate in that environment when you are, you know, the exact opposite? You are so intuitive because not only am I an artist and I am an art teacher, but I'm a yoga instructor <laughs> so, <laughs> and I'm a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> so I am like the funky person in all these worlds. Uh, not only do I eat meat, like I eat lots of meat and only meat. I, I, I will say, um, just as a PS side note, uh, I'll, I will have fried onions sometimes if it's there. Um, there are a few fruits that don't bother me, avocado, uh, olives. Um, but I, I barely ever think about them. So that, if that, you know, if someone wonders, uh, if someone gave me a burger with some fried onions, I'd eat it. But, um, but it is really weird in my world because um, if I'm at a yoga training with 10 other people, <laughs> one of the studios where I teach in DC is in Adams Morgan and next door is a shop called the Federalist Pig. It is the best barbecue <laughs> joint. <laughs> But when we take a break from a training, like people are getting the mac and cheese, the Brussels sprouts, the Cajun green beans, and I'm getting like the wings, um, the pork belly, and the brisket, <laughs> and um, and not the not the garlic toast. So it is it is strange, and um, I, I have found the best thing is I just don't come out with like my meat banner on and just like. <laughs> you know, that was, you're killing yourself and those are poisons and that's why you feel so terrible. And 
it, it just when it naturally and organically comes up little by little, or someone may mm -hmm. say something and then, you know, you'll have those moments where everyone just stops like, what? You're, not, you're gonna have colorectal cancer and you're gonna, um, your cholesterol must be through the roof and. Um, the worst is just that look of disappointment. Like, I thought you cared about yourself or the earth. And you're like all of these cows are, you know, killing the earth. But what, what I enjoy is every now and again, uh, this happened on Saturday. I was at a training actually. And someone just pulled me aside and said, Hey, can I just ask you like, what, what are the toxins in vegetables? Tell like, tell me about it. And it's great when someone is really truly interested and they are just open to like, because surely there, there's some, maybe there's something you don't know. And that's how I like to embrace life. Like uh, I love to travel. Um, I have a yoga retreat business also. And one of the things that I love is to see that all around the world, people are living, um, loving, raising their children, educating themselves. And they do it in different ways, but it's not necessarily a bad way. It's different. And so it's funny that in the yoga world, in the art world, you'll have people who think they have really open minds, but they don't. And even the dogma <laughs> of the modern day, <laughs> the modern RDA has really, really infiltrated them. And then this, this um, agenda of plant-based world has mm -hmm. really infiltrated them. And I, it's very rare that I find someone like I did on Saturday and my friend who just said, hey, like, share with me because I'm also a gardener. I have these huge gardens. So people are like, oh, you have all these vegetables. And like, no, I give them away, actually. Yeah. I keep with I know. I love plants. I have tons of house plants, but, um, yeah. you know, and I love them. So I don't eat them. <laughs> <laughs> I mostly grow flowers, but I do have some squash and kale and mm -hmm. um, green beans and things like that, okra. And I gave them away. And um, I like mm -hmm. the flowers that they produce. And, um, but yeah, I am, um, I'm a unicorn in all these worlds and, um, and it's kind of fun sometimes. Kind of fun so do you think that people are starting to open up because, you know, they're watching you over an extended period of time eating this way and, you know, reconsidering whether it's harmful? No, not, I mean, not really. I, I switched my husband, which was probably the most important thing. Um, but no, I don't think so because I think, um, I think like we're mostly in this matrix and the modern day foods are very addictive and it is really difficult to go off to see a plate with just meat to see a plate, like to not have your side and your vegetable and not have two vegetables and not have um, uh, a soda or even people who are not drinking sodas, they're drinking juice. I mean, it's just so foreign and strange that um, I, I just don't know. I don't see, I, I have not changed very many people. <laughs> I'm not impressed very many people. They all are <laughs> praying for me and. Um, <laughs> well, how, wait, how long have you been at this? Um, so I have been back to carnivore. Like, no, let's just go back all the way to the very beginning before you oh, fell off. Before I fell off. Uh, carnivore a year, but keto like two years. Okay. So it feels like about um, three years. Because even with keto, I would have meals where I would just have a burger and a hot dog, of course. I mean, you right. don't have to, like, uh, I don't think that keto says you must eat vegetables at every meal. It's the idea of putting your body right. in doses. Um, yeah. But really, uh, really understanding and uh, carnivore for a year. Okay. Yeah. Well, um <laughs> So I, you know, it, it will take time. I, you know, definitely it, now I'm coming up on my three-year anniversary. And I think in the beginning, uh, you know, people of course thought I was crazy and, you know, didn't understand, but over time, um, you know, now I feel that people are much more open to asking me questions and, and really trying to understand what I'm saying. 
So, you know, and maybe in another five years when I look the same, <laughs> you know, they will be like, huh, you know, what is it you're doing? So, um, you know, so I, I think that it, it just does take some time. So I'd be curious to, to circle back around with you in year yeah. two and three and see what people have to say. Me too. Me too. Yeah. So yeah. can you go back to your fasting regimen? I'd love to hear about that. I know lots of, um, you know, lots of the people in the black uh, carnivore community do fast and, um, you know, and I, I understand that it is, you know, very beneficial. I'd love to hear what, you know, what you were saying about the combination of carnivore and fasting being really powerful. You know, I'm always asking the question, um, you know, is fasting, um, like the studies about fasting being really beneficial are done on people who are not eating a carnivore diet. So if you, which is a fasting mimicking diet. So if you, you know, do you get further benefit by fasting when you're following a fasting mimicking diet or is it, you know, is there, I mean, are those states sort of equivalent? So I'm right. curious to, you know, from you to hear your experience. Yes. yes. And nobody has the answer for me. So I'm just you right, know, right. loving to hear your thoughts. I, I um, years ago, uh, I mean, my entire life as a Christian, you hear about fasting. It's, it's uh, I think many different faiths have fasting as part of their faith. And so I grew up with people fasting and I was always like, no way. <laughs> and I carried that, that uh, stigma into my mind as an adult. And I didn't really understand it at all. And it was really difficult as a, a carb addict to understand fasting because you're a sugar burner. And so your body does not want to burn fat at all. <laughs> it's, it, you're, um, and so it just didn't ever feel good or normal. Uh, when I came back to carnivore um, and just carnivore period, all of a sudden, after about... Uh, I don't know. It was kind of instantaneous, maybe a week or so. I realized, wow, I'm just not hungry. I mean, it was natural. So uh, I love Kelly Hogan and um, I watched, I learned a lot from her and she will say, I do not fast, but I eat lunch and dinner and I'm not hungry again until the next day at lunch. So that's kind of how my fasting started. It wasn't a purposeful thing. I just realized I am just not hungry. I'm so completely satiated and satisfied. My body has enough nourishment. I'm doing all, all my exercise, almost 100% I'm doing fasted. And I, I did not have any loss of energy. I had as like, I, if I walk three miles, I could go three more miles if I wanted to. If I do a 75 minute power yoga, I could do another one if I wanted to in a fasted state. And so then uh, some days the 18 hours, like dinner would come that that time period would come and I wasn't hungry and I just wouldn't eat and um so that how do you manage that with your family do you just sit with them or what <laughs> that that is a challenge because um I'm a mom of seven now I have uh, oh seven <laughs> yeah it's a huge household but, but now my oldest is 31. So what, who I have home now are the two youngest who wouldn't even be home if it wasn't COVID. They're college at home because they're online college. So they're not in their dorms. And then my oldest son can't get back to Hong Kong because of COVID. So he's here. Um, he came last January and he got stuck and he can't get back. He's waiting on a visa. And um, so I have three kids home. I wouldn't have any of them home except for breaks and holidays. But I also share a household with my brother who's a quadriplegic and I prepare a lot of meals for him. And uh, my husband who eats two to three steaks every day, uh, he loves to say he's a carnivore because he eats probably 75% carnivore. Um, and, but he'll eat other stuff too. And so that's always there. And um, so that part is a challenge because you, you, I think integrity and character really grows when I smell bacon like I did this morning at nine o'clock. Like it smells good. I can acknowledge it smells really good, but I'm, I'm not hungry. And so I think it takes time. It takes, uh, it takes time for me when I discovered so I fell into fasting and then that made me start to research more and more and more. 
Um, and then I discovered the amazing, amazing benefits that were happening in my body. And so now it's easier to overcome the bacon that smells in the mm-hmm. house. And uh, a lot of the food I do prepare for other people are carb foods, carb-based foods. So um, that's not as much of a challenge because I don't want to eat that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, smelling steak and bacon at 9 a.m. <laughs> can be a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. Um, but do you, do you like join and sit down and, you know, share, I mean, oh yeah, yeah. share the time together at right, the table? Right. Sometimes. Uh-huh. I mean, I will say that our family, just because our kids are, are um, grown, that we don't always have these sit down meals, but, um, but yeah, at dinner time, um, well, I usually, I, I, I set up my fasting unless I'm doing um, a 36 hour I set it up so that I'm always eating in the evening because that is when I do get hungry. I do get hungry like between three and five o'clock. Um, as oh. A, yeah. As yeah. A, you know, I find that interesting. That's like a time for me too as well to get hungry, but it's such a weird time because like if you're going out to a restaurant, that's when they're closed. <laughs> if you're going to eat with other people, that's when people are not eating. So right. it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like what I do is a meal and a tasting probably five to six days a week, I do a meal and a tasting. And so if I know I'm going out to eat somewhere, I would have a tasting and then I would have the meal for the restaurant. Or if it's a restaurant where there's not going to be anything that I can really eat, then I'll have the meal at home and then I'll have the tasting at the restaurant. So it does Mm -hmm. give me some flexibility and it gives you so much power that if you don't eat, you can just order coffee or tea and you feel, you feel happy about it. You feel good about it. Mm -hmm. So So do you ever get caught out where like you thought you were going to be able to eat something at the restaurant and then you couldn't. And so you fast or what do you do? Yeah. You have, uh, extra coffee. (laughs) <laughs> think about just sitting there with everybody else because it's very social um mm-hmm. but i can almost always find something like mm-hmm. any american restaurant has wings and i love wings i could eat wings every day uh and they always have a steak or something like that um i i can i can usually i can usually find some but they like dessert time i'll order an extra coffee <coughs> um so yeah, yeah, if that's a challenge. Uh, another challenge is uh, I I love sushi, but you know I had to give up my my rice sushi rolls, and um, it's just only so much sashimi I'm gonna eat. So at that point, right. I'm just you know I'm just having tea. Yeah, so, yeah. So yeah. Wow. So what about the kids? Have they like? started to do what you're doing or what do they what do they think about what you're eating um they have they have so many comments they're very sarcastic (laughs) i probably raised them that way uh actually my oldest daughter is super all my kids are open-minded so let's say that i'm not saying that she is to say that they aren't because they're probably all watch this at some point um but my oldest daughter exposed me to gaps many years ago when she was doing some healing And so she is really very open to um, embracing and under, so she knows what I'm doing and she thinks it's great. A couple of my kids are like, mom, are you okay? And uh, one daughter I was sharing with her that I eat like seven to nine meals a week. And she was like, that is just not healthy. And I'm like, but look, I'm, I'm really healthy. I'm, I mean, you know, so yeah, they say things like that or, um, or, you know, they have their sarcastic points, but they're, they're cool because there's lots of good meat in the house and they enjoy it. <laughs> no vegetarians in my house at all. Um, they're definitely omni- omnivores for sure. Yeah. Well, so I'd be curious to hear what were some of the benefits that you, um, you know, that you gained from eating this way? How have you uh, improved? Oh my gosh. The top benefit is being back in control of like cravings do not rule me, temptations. Uh, my mind is focused, like I can really focus even longer on uh, my research that I'm doing, on art, uh, on teaching classes, I like one after the other and I'm not wondering like, when is my next meal? Almost like uh, those meals were constantly these rewards for me. 
I don't see food as this reward because I did this mm -hmm. good thing or I, uh, I taught 36 kids at the university on Zoom the first time. It was so crazy when everything switched to Zoom. And, you know, all I could think about is, okay, when am I putting the breaks in to have snacks? And so that, I, I would think that's probably the top benefit is being in control and food doesn't control me. Uh, another serious benefit is my sleep. My sleep is so deep that it's, it's borderline comatose. <laughs> <laughs> and five hours of sleep feels like eight hours of sleep. I get so much more bang for my buck now with my sleep uh, and my husband, whom I love dearly for 32 years, but um, he is a, a vocal sleeper. <laughs> <laughs> he snores <laughs> and um and so I don't once I if I fall asleep you know I don't hear him anymore like he can snore all he wants it's, you know in, in the beginning I may hear him but um but that was that that amount of sleep made me so much more rested and so much more mm -hmm. um so if you take away the cravings and um you know, everywhere you go now, like if you go to a meeting, they're going to bring out donuts and snacks and cookies. And if you go to um, a conference, the food is going to be laid out. If you go to a friend's house, there's going to be snacks there. It's always like food, 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 food. And I, I always had some. I mean, I always had some. And um, now I have so much power over that. And uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, those are my top two benefits. Of course, um, digestive like no more food belly no more um what do they call it food baby that <laughs> you get uh those food babies you get at thanksgiving or family meals like yeah. no more of that um no more indigestion uh no more um long times in the bathroom <laughs> um everything is like just wonderful and beautiful with digestion and mm -hmm. just the opposite of what people think. Um, people think that you need fiber and you actually only need fiber if you eat fiber. <laughs> but yeah. if you don't eat fiber, yeah. you don't need fiber. And yeah. so, um, so yeah, that is uh, just indigestion and feeling good. And then long, long energy. And um, this is what I was explaining to someone is that as a sugar burner, because I was a sugar burner, I grew up in, in, a, in a black and an Italian household. So good, good food all the time, all day and night. Uh, so I, I never really had, I never burned much fat. I don't think most of my life. And the times that I did diet, like the 50 different diets that I tried and went through, uh, they were all about um, having small, small amounts of low fat, food and still high carbs and things like that. So yeah, you do lose some weight, but you feel miserable, you feel terrible, and you're still, um, and if you get thin, you're still fat thin because you're not burning a lot of your fat. But now as a fat burner, uh, you have energy like this, like all mm. day long. You don't go up and you don't go down. You just have this amazing, amazing energy. And if you do get hungry, like if I'm engrossed in uh, a painting and the hunger is like tapping on my shoulder, I'm like, okay, okay, I hear you, but I'm doing this. And then it taps again. Okay, okay. And then like an hour and a half will go by and you're never hangry. You're just like, okay, I know it's there. I'm going to eat soon, but you can still keep doing what you're doing without anxiety and stress mm -hmm. and, um, and I don't even half the time know what I'm going to eat when I go in the kitchen. It's like, okay, oh, there's some steaks here my husband left, or there's some ground beef, or there's this. So there is just, you know, the, the, the thoughts are off of food and mm -hmm. the power, like I'm in the driver's seat of my life is what it has done for me. Wow. So all of that is amazing. And, um, you know, and I can see how that would be so beneficial for your life, your goals, you know, what you're trying to accomplish. And I think it's interesting that I didn't hear in there anything about weight loss. So had you lost all the weight you wanted to lose? Were you, did you not ever need to lose weight? What, what was your relationship to weight? Oh yeah. I, um, I have, uh, 
Yes. I am the person that had several sizes of jeans, like size six to uh. size 14 in my closet at one time. I uh, had seven babies, so I uh, I breastfed for 14 years. <laughs> so yes, I um, definitely, as I got older, when I would lose and gain and lose and gain, the weight would come back and it really centered in my belly. So that was a huge, big concern for me. When I went to, when I switched to keto, I mean, the original reason for switching to keto was for losing weight, for sure. Uh, when I found carnivore, I stayed with carnivore because now, now I still have, um, I think I, I need to lose 20 pounds. I'm, I'm still like, and it's happening slowly without any thought to it. Um, but, uh, carnivore showed me that not having extra weight around your belly is crucial for heart health, for longevity. Uh, leaner people are just healthier people, period. We weren't meant to carry this extra fat. It's not about um, not, um, it's not about body shaming or anything like that. It's about like health. I'm a yoga instructor. So it's about your body being this vessel for your spirit and you need it to be as strong as possible. But carnivore showed me that the foods were, were, not just giving me the weight, but also the pain in my hip that would not go away was probably from oxalates. And the pain, the swelling in my ankles was, I mean, I don't know, lectins, phytates, oxalates, pick one of those, but it was definitely due to plant products. And so, yes, the weight is important. I want to be lean and spelt and all of those things. Um, but it's, it's for, it's truly, uh, now for health is the top concern. Yeah. And how I feel like I just feel good all the time, like all the time. Yeah. Well, I'd be curious. I mean, as someone who does yoga, uh, you know, I mean, I noticed for myself that, you know, when I have more weight or less weight, you know, the way I move through the world, the way I even, uh, breathe and speak is different. You know, how, um, like the way air moves through your lungs and your and your diaphragm expands, um, that changes when you have more fat in that area than less. So I'm curious, you know, does your yoga change? Like, do you notice, you know, your practice changes? Yes, yes, definitely. When I gained back weight, uh, there, you know, all of our yoga poses are in Sanskrit. We have the American version, but. Um, a pose I do almost always in the beginning of class, Paschimottanasana, and it's just sitting flat, your legs are out, you're sitting up, and you fold forward with your head going towards your feet. And I mean, I can tell, like you can, you can tell I've been a yoga instructor for six years, and I grew back belly fat and lost belly fat, and it, it just does not feel good. Um, when you're standing up and you fold forward to put your hands, you know, to touch the floor, I mean, you feel your belly fat and um, it's, it's not healthy, it's not strong, it's not, uh, and I'm not, okay, I'm not saying that people who have belly fat are not strong and don't have an amazing yoga practice because I still am losing belly fat. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. I don't want to put that out there. Uh, and I have all, I think everybody, if you have a body, you can practice yoga. So that's not what I'm saying. But for me personally, my body was not meant to carry extra belly fat and extra fat on my inner thighs. And, and I don't feel like I want to feel. I just don't. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I know that if I eat the, body, the food that was made for humans, <laughs> which is what I believe, and, uh, and fast, and I, I, I had a point to make that I, I think I got off track uh, with fasting. I, to me, the reason why fasting became such an important part of my life now, combined with carnivore together, is t it feels very natural and organic. And I think about when, even when I was a kid, I was born in 68. When I was a kid, there was not all this snacking. Like, we ate breakfast, we ate lunch, we ate dinner. And mm -hmm. there would sometimes be some, again, in an Italian household, there would be Stella Doro cookies on the uh, cupboard shelf. Um, but 
there was not this, there was not this idea that uh, a school event, then we also had to have a snack with it. And um, I taught art at a camp as a teenager and I was thinking back to the kids at that camp and they brought their lunch, but there wasn't like a snack before and a snack that, and then after. And nowadays, like kids at soccer games, as soon as the soccer game is over, they have to pull out snacks, bags of chips and orange wedges. And uh, every event, like I have two grandchildren, they have so many snacks in their lunch bag if my daughter is listening. <laughs> eat a meal. <laughs> and so, um, I, I think when I, when I recognize how fasting started happening organically in my life, I think about people 100, 200, 500 years ago, where were all of these like packaged snacks? Where were these boxes of 12s, you know, juice boxes? And, and how could you go? Like you couldn't, you ate a meal and often you wouldn't have another meal for a day. And yeah. it was normal. And the fat on your body, that was your meal. That's the way God designed our bodies. <laughs> so when you yeah. don't have a meal, you still have a meal. You're eating from your backside and your, your arms here. And, and it, your body is storing it just for that reason. And yeah. so that's why I just, I felt like, wow, that's why I naturally start to listen that, you know, I'm just not hungry for 18, 20 hours, you know? And, um, and if you have something you want to heal in your body, and you can research that, everybody can. Um, again, I highly recommend uh, Dr. Jason Fung and, and uh, his research assistants will show you that almost everything that we have today is related to obesity and constant food and insulin. It's all related to that. And so, yeah, that... Um, is it better with carnivore? Yes, because when I'm not eating, I'm not craving. I don't... I'm not igniting my, my pancreas all day with insulin. So I eat, I feel really satiated. The fat is the main ingredient in my diet and I have energy for forever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's how it all kind of morphed together, but not a plan. I had no idea when I came back to carnivore that I was going to be a faster and that I would just love it this much. Um, yeah. Wow. That's really awesome. Yeah. So would you say um, that eating carnivore has affected your, like your life philosophy? Has it impacted your artwork? Um, you know, any of that, your, your yoga practice and. <laughs> yeah, it, it really has impacted my philosophy in that I see even more the character that I want for myself to, to uh, I teach a class for a university called Change, um, and, it, and it is uh, self-actualizing and realizing that um, it's all about a decision you make. Your feelings and your emotions are not based on situations and people. They're based on decisions that you make. And, but when I was, when I was uh, mostly a car-based <laughs> eater, so many of my decisions were out of my control because I was ruled by uh, hormones and like everything that, I don't know, I don't want to say, I mean, I was creating great art. I was, I was raising my kids. I mean, I homeschooled for 25 years. So I was doing all these wonderful things. I, I became a yoga teacher, but I just realized so much of my life was about uh, fulfilling my tastes, fulfilling, um, uh, uh, treating myself. And now <clears throat> I'm able to see that again, even deeper, this class that I teach, that it is, um, I'm not, I'm not saying this well, but, um, I just being back in the, in the driver's seat, being, being the pilot, like the true pilot of my life. And, if something crazy happens and I don't eat for three days, I'm like, wow, like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to wonder. I'm not going to like it. And I just see that's how humanity survived. Like we could, we could mm -hmm. not have survived 500 years ago if people had to eat from sun up until they went to sleep. Um, yeah. Three meals plus three snacks plus coffee plus, you know, and I love coffee and all those things, but um, we, we, we wouldn't have lived if, if that was the way, and that's not how our bodies are made. 
Yeah. I mean, and I, I like to think of, uh, you know, in my former life, I was getting a PhD in anthropology. So I've always been interested in how other people live and, uh, you know, the subsistence patterns of people, both in the modern age and also, um, you know, prehistorically. But, you know, one thing we see, um, I mean, I don't know how far back this goes, but women are the ones who are handling food and the home and so on. And before you have refrigeration, uh, dishwashers and so on, like food preparation is like a ton of work. And so if you have people eating all day long, like the people who are working to prepare that food and deal with it and put it away and clean up are working all day long, that much longer beyond the time that people are eating. So um, I can totally understand why you might just have a cutoff. And, and you know, I was born in 71, so I grew up in, the, you know, the I feel like a little bit before, you know, the snack wells, low fat craze came. So I do have a bit of, of uh, memory of that time when you had these distinct meals, there wasn't, you know, constant eating. And I remember, you know, my grandmother was always battling like a mouse problem in the house. So when we ate dinner, that was it. Dinner was eaten, dishes were washed, everything was put away, food was put away, and the kitchen was closed until breakfast. Right. And that was absolutely it. And so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, now when people are like, you must have a snack, it's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> That's not true. Mm-hmm. You know, you should be able to go six hours without eating, without feeling like you're going to murder somebody or totally fall out. Right, right. And, and, and I don't think it's the fault of so many people because I just feel like, man, I was sold a bill of goods for so long. I mean, I remember trying Weight Watchers. We were living in Chicago and having my little booklet. This was before smartphones and things like that. So there was no app. And I had to check off all these boxes. And I had this like book in my pocketbook everywhere I went. And <clears throat> it was like, this is crazy. And they had built in all these, like you were eating all day, little bits of things. And it was just like, whoa, there's something wrong with this picture, like really wrong. So that, um, and excuse me, I feel like I would have gotten to this place at some point because of, uh, my art and how we, how we decided to homeschool our children and get off the matrix of, um, uh, mainstream education and what we believe about that, my husband and I, and, uh, we had several of our kids at home and, Little by little, we're like, you know what? There are a lot of things that Americans just don't get right. And they also are ignorant of, and they just don't know. And there's so much more out there. And so we've just always been willing to, to open up and explore that and, and be open to our, our uh, regular MO being changed. <laughs> Yeah. And, and like, like, what else is there? So, you know, I would say to people, if you, if you think carnivores are crazy, just try it, like try it for, for a week. I mean, try for a month really is what you need to do, but try it for a week and, and you might be very, very surprised. And it's not something that was just made up last week. I mean, this is how people ate for thousands of years. Uh, up in the top of, of Canada, there, there are no citrus groves. There are no wheat fields. Like people were living off of fat and some berries would come into season for a short while and they had no hypertension, no tooth decay, no diabetes, very little cancer, no kidney metabolic disease until the Western foods came there. I mean, that's just a fact. That's just science and history. So that is what, you know, when people finally, like you're in a group and the conversation comes back to, are you serious? You really just like all you ate in the last three days was steak and burgers and wings. <laughs> like, is that really healthy? And, um, and then, you know, to share like, Hey, like this really did happen mm-hmm. forever. And, um, how we eat now is just a short blip in the span of mankind. We did not have bread all day. We did not have, have sugar. A, a family, like a couple hundred, even a hundred years ago, one family would have one bag of sugar for the entire year. That was what their family had. And, yeah. you know, an average American kid is eating that much sugar in a month. One kid. So, 
Yeah. I remember the first time it occurred to me, gee, I'm eating a lot of sugar. Uh, I lived in LA and there was a lemon tree in the backyard. So I would make lemonade all the time. And I just had a, a big pitcher, you know, a two liter pitcher that I kept in the fridge and I just made lemonade whenever it was out. And I had uh, a five pound bag of sugar. And then I think like maybe a month, six weeks later, it was gone. And I was like, God, that, <laughs> that seems like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, it wasn't enough to like change my behavior, but it was just like, huh, <laughs> that's right. a lot. Right. Right. And that's just added sugar that you physically had to add. Exactly. Yeah. That didn't include the donuts, <laughs> chocolate uh, cake or any of the other stuff. Yes. <laughs> Ketchup and the, like the sauces and yeah. you know, all of those things. And, and what I think people don't get is there, there are only three things. There's only fat, protein, and carbs. Like if it's mm -hmm. not fat and protein, it's sugar. Like broccoli is sugar. It's just, yeah. that it's a better form of sugar for your body and your teeth. And, and you're not going to have a huge spike with eating a bowl of broccoli, but it is still sugar and rice is sugar. And, yeah. You know, quinoa is sugar. So, um, and all that riced cauliflower that I ate a billion pounds of when I first found keto because it's like, I can't not have rice. I can't not have a pizza crust. And, you know, um, so yeah, the keto fied foods really, uh, they were not, they, they were not good for me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. But, um, but I think it's a better version than, than what people have now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, but before we come to a close, I'd love for you to like promote yourself because I see you have lovely artwork. If people want to see more of that, where do they go? If, they, if you teach classes, how do they sign up? And do you do your yoga remotely or, right. or what do you do? Ooh, thank you. I uh, had to start teaching yoga remotely in March, and I haven't stopped. Uh, if you live in D.C., I do do yoga in the gardens when the weather's warm, but other than that, <laughs> I teach on Zoom, and my website is anafog.com, and uh, I teach art classes on Zoom. I teach private art classes, and usually the student or the person um, tells me what they want to do in their art. Uh, abstract they just want more creativity and I come up with classes for them they want to paint and I also teach artful journaling um, one of my always with me wherever I go is uh, my journal in this leather book and um, is that a Midori type journal yeah or? yeah yeah exactly exactly um, this one was custom made for me but I use we, we do have some planner fanatics in our group um, uh -huh. so yeah feel free to you know to yeah. use all of the fancy language and <laughs> okay and well for planner fanatics I keep my everyday journal in a Hobonichi I do collage the cover and then uh, I have a I have calendars in the front but then there's a page for every day of the year. So I do art on every page as well as journaling on those pages. And so I actually teach this class, Artful Journaling. I've been teaching this for probably 10 years. And I teach how to use art in an everyday journal and combine that with writing to harness and just pull out the creativity in yourself. Not because you wanna become an artist per se, but you want to be better at business. You want to be better at relationships. You want to understand yourself better. And some people don't write every day in their journals. Um, over here is like a stack of some of my art journals. Um, some of them have themes. So some people will do one on uh, relationship with their husband and they're cultivating that or um, how they're working with let's say their garden, they're a first time gardener, so all of their journaling and their art connects with that. But I also teach art theory at the same time, so you get a chance to understand how colors go together and how to draw a human face. Like I think everybody should be able to draw a human face. Like you're, it's, it's you <laughs> and you're looking at faces all day. So I teach some, some art theory as well and mix that in with really the love of color and paint and texture and design. And I do all of that on Zoom. You can contact me with, uh, at anafog.com. And um, that is my great, great love besides my children, my grandchildren, is 
using art to help people to understand themselves better and the world better. I love, love, love those journals. And I, I said I wanted to sign up for the course and, uh, you know, got busy and everything, but I definitely want to do that. I think, um, you know, I love, uh, you know, drawing and journaling and that was, you know, nothing nearly as elaborate as what you do, but I, I you have been doing some, something like that since like high school, just drawing yeah. and, you know, collage and, you know, oh, yeah, like souvenirs from the day. Yeah. 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 And, and what, ha what happens is for me, I take a lot of art classes. Uh, I'm signed up right now for three different online thinking, three, three different classes. And it gives you some accountability and it mm -hmm. gives you this date, like Wednesday at 11 a.m. is my artful journaling class. And there are some people who take it, uh, take the recorded version because they're working. But it, you know, every week you're going to get a class with me. You're going to do the art together with me. And then I'm going to give you some homework to do. And uh, I feature every series. I feature uh, someone from art history. So Frida Kahlo mm -hmm. or... Uh, Leonardo or someone you learn a little bit more of um, and it's just it just makes you a more interesting and multifaceted person as well art is like our phones like if we didn't have art we would not have smartphones this is all art this is all, <laughs> yeah you know and uh, teaching art to youth is really to me I, I I help parents understand that if you're going to be a stickler with their art essay, with their uh, English essay and their math homework and their science lab book, why are you not having the same weight for art? Because you carry a smartphone, mom and dad, and yeah. every, every part of your life is impacted by art and, and how that opens up your child to be more creative in all the things that they do. So. Yeah. So yeah, I have, a, I have several uh, young people who take private art classes with me, especially because they're not in school. And yeah. that is, um, it is so much fun, really, really fun to see them come back the next week with, with their assignments. I just wish I could like, hug them. Um, I still have one in-person Monday art class in Bowie. If you're a homeschool kid or mom listening to this, there is a homeschool co-op in Bowie where I teach on Mondays. And, um, so yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to sign up for the art journaling. Definitely. I, uh, this Wednesday, I think I can yeah. definitely make it. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. Wednesday. And definitely I would love to have you. And, um, it's, it's fun. Take, take some of your art and make stickers out of it. This is what some of my students do. Uh, so wait, where do you get your stuff printed? Cause I opened a red bubble store and I've been making like t-shirt designs and different oh, yeah. stuff that I put on things. And people have been ordering like magnets, coasters, uh, yeah. you know, all I, I made an apron, a black carnivore apron. So, um, you know, I, I, I encourage you, I'll have, I'll put the link for red bubble down below, okay. but where do you get your stuff? I printed? just learned about red bubble. And as you say that now I'm starting to realize, okay, other people can buy it. I go, I use sticker mule and I just order, uh, my own stickers from them. And then I get, oh, okay. Them. Like I, I order them to give to students. Um, this is a piece I made for my youngest daughter. She started as a freshman at Towson in Baltimore, outside of Baltimore, um, for her college dorm. Unfortunately, she only stayed there for one week until she was back home. But I make them and I give them out to, to students and um, yoga students and things like that. Uh huh and mail them as treats to art students. And they're wonderful because they're vinyl. I think Redbubble has the same thing, right? Vinyl stickers that can go in the uh, bottles. I'm not sure. Okay. They probably do because that's what all the industry is doing now. So then you can still wash your things with those stickers on them. But um, uh, I have okay. a sticker mule and uh, I have to look into Redbubble so I can yeah, they, you can print things on um, a lot of different types of products and they ship them, you know, directly out. So yeah. it, it just makes the whole process easier. But it's, it's a nice way to like share your designs more broadly mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, with anybody. I will be sharing that with students tomorrow to encourage yeah. them because it's, it's really, it feels, it's very proud feeling when you see your work on a sticker. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. You know, someone just accepts it, and then you say, "Oh, I did that." They're like, "What?" It looks so official, and 
and wonderful. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know I'm just starting to teach myself now Photoshop so I can do better um, designs. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, I, have, it was an artist for a long time and then I just kind of put it all down and decided to sort of shut that part out of my life. Right. I don't know why. So well, you're, still, no. you're still an artist, you know, everybody is an artist until they're told they're not. So yeah, you, well, it, actually leaning into it, I see that, uh, you know, it's still been growing inside me as I've been growing. It just, mm -hmm. you know, I just wasn't expressing it that way. But now that I am, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah. I remember this. I remember how to do this. That is awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thanks for sharing that. And um, that, that is what I love to do most of all. And um, and getting a commission piece from someone to do a wall in their kid's bedroom and they're just like, let's use lots of reds and blues and put some trucks in it and then everything else is like, I'm like in heaven with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if people want to get in contact with you and ask you questions and whatnot, uh, where should they go? How should they? Um, they can connect with me at anafog.com. There's a spot where you can send me a question. And I'm also on Instagram, Anna Fogg one And I'm also on Facebook, Anna Romaine Fogg. My middle name is Romaine like lettuce. <laughs> it's a family name, but Anna Romaine Fogg. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I, man, this has been a great conversation. And uh, so for all of you Black Carnivores who are watching and you are interested, I encourage you to go check out Anna and check out all of her stuff. Sign up for her courses. And, um, you know, and stay tuned for more interesting stories as uh, I, I continue to talk to the people in our community who are doing so well on this way of eating. Oh, wow. Um, Thank yeah. you so much, today. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. All right, everybody. So I will see you soon. And uh, till next time.